Over the past four years, I've had the privilege of interviewing over a hundred guests on dozens of different topics. And today we thought it'd be interesting to go back into the archives to find some of our favorite clips related to the big topic of apologetics. Today, we're going to be hearing from the likes of Rebecca McLaughlin on how non-Christians often unknowingly borrow from a Christian worldview, from William Lane Craig on the problem of evil, from Peter Williams on the so-called contradictions of the Bible, from Michael Kruger on preparing ourselves to engage with unbelievers in everyday life, and from Neil Shenby on how the study of mathematics testifies to God's existence. To start off, let's go back to a conversation with Rebecca McLaughlin, author of the best-selling book, Confronting Christianity. In this clip, Rebecca and I discuss the propensity of new atheist writers like Richard Dawkins to make sweeping moral claims, while at the same time denying the only basis for a universal morality. She also pushes back against the idea that science and the Bible are fundamentally at odds with each other, an idea promoted by both many non-Christians and even some Christians. Take a listen. And I want to read this quote by Richard Dawkins. It's a famous quote that I think really captures the sentiment of some of these atheistic scientists. He writes, The universe has precisely the properties we should expect if there is at bottom no design, no purpose, no evil, no good, nothing but blind, pitiless indifference. Mm. What do you say to that? Firstly, I would say that Richard Dawkins and other writers of his ilk often ask questions of science that science is not designed to answer for us. And that plays out in two directions. One is they sneak metaphysical claims into scientific statements. There's a whole other dimension that plays out where a new atheist author like Richard Dawkins will make these these bold statements on the basis of science that there is at bottom in the universe, no evil, no good, um, no justice, you know, these, these sort of massive statements with huge ethical implications. And yet would argue that human beings should all be seen as innately and, and equally valuable, uh, that men should be seen as equally valuable to women, that um, racism is wrong, et cetera, et cetera, that, that there should be this fundamental idea of universal human equality from which all sorts of other ethical positions spring. And in fact, by their own lips, as it were, none of that is is grounded in their beliefs. They they typically have this sort of high uh, moral ideals that that have essentially been inherited from Christianity They've ripped out the idea of God from underneath those ideals and are claiming that atheism supports them better than Christianity ever did. And it's simply not true. Hmm. Yeah, it seems like on both sides of the issue, whether they're atheistic scientists or even some Christians are responsible for painting a picture that science and faith can't go together, that um, as soon as they come into contact, it's almost like they cancel each other out or something like (laughs) that. And you have to kind of keep them separate. What do you think about that? I think part of it is that on both sides, there can be this idea that the more we understand of science, the less room there is for God. And I don't think that's true at all. I think, in fact, the more we understand of science, the more detail we see of how God has worked and operated. So I think sometimes we have this idea that sort of more science means less God. And that's not true. And another analogy you could look at is is the Bible where people will sometimes say, well, do you think the Bible was written by God or written by humans? I'm like, well, (laughs) there's the funny thing with the Bible is that it's entirely written by humans and entirely inspired by God. So actually you can't play those two things off against each other. It's it's both at the same time. But hasn't that been exactly what Christians have done? We've argued for a kind of God of the gaps where uh, whatever kind of scientific or whatever kind of phenomenon that we're observing that science can't yet describe or explain, we we see that as evidence for God. And then science comes along and starts to explain that phenomenon and gives us some, some measurable, testable, verifiable mm-hmm. uh, causes. And then that kind of pushes God out of the equation. Yeah, so I think it's certainly the case that Christians have at times poorly defined their, their sense of the relationship between God and science. And that that has has led us to some 
unfortunate situations where people have been arguing on the basis of, you know, one gap or another or one scientific hypothesis or another um, for or against God. And I think that's something that we, you know, we need to re- reckon with, particularly in, in sort of contemporary Christianity in America. I think what's interesting, though, is that the new atheist story says time and again, Christians have believed X and then science has come and told them Y. And then Christians have had to revise hypothesis, <laughs> you know, number one in light of science and you know, atheism marches on. What's interesting to me is something like the the Big Bang, which was first dreamt up by a Catholic priest uh, and was strongly resisted at the time by many atheist physicists because it implied that the universe had a beginning. And there was a, a common view at the time among scientists that actually the universe had, had always existed and that there had been a sort of steady state rather than a, a beginning sort of sudden explosion from from a tiny nothing uh, into what we see now. And so today, I think even a number of Christians think of the Big Bang as you know, another area in which science and Christianity are, are locked in mortal conflict um, and sort of undermining our sense of a creator when it was almost alarmingly close to the idea of God creating the universe out of nothing. William Lane Craig is one of the most well-known and respected Christian apologists living today. In this excerpt from our interview, he addresses one of the toughest apologetics topics there is, the problem of evil, explaining why the existence of evil and the existence of an all-powerful, all-loving God are not mutually exclusive. He then highlights a few weak yet common apologetics arguments in favor of God that Christians sometimes use that you might want to avoid when having conversations with unbelievers. Take a listen. The Bible teaches that God is both all-powerful and all-loving, and yet evil exists, evil that every day causes indescribable pain and suffering in this world. Uh, Many people listening might know what that feels like in their own lives. And in light of the existence of evil, how could God be both all-powerful and all-loving? Only one of those things could be true, right? Mm -hmm. No, I think that both can be true. And I think in getting at this problem, it's very helpful to distinguish between what I call the intellectual problem of evil and the emotional problem of evil. Mm. The intellectual problem of evil is how to give an intellectual account of the compatibility of God and evil. The emotional problem of evil is how to dissolve people's dislike of a God who would allow them or others to suffer so terribly. Mm. And I'm convinced, Matt, that for most people, the problem of evil is not an intellectual problem. It is an emotional problem. Problem. And you don't use that word disparagingly, right? Emotional. No, no, because it is emotionally difficult. Yeah. But what I want to say is that as a purely intellectual problem, when I consider it as a philosopher, it is extraordinarily difficult to prove any kind of incompatibility mm. between God and the evil and suffering in the world. Philosophers have tried to prove this for generations, and no one's been a ever been able to do it. No one has ever been able to show that given the evil in the world, it is logically impossible or highly improbable that God exists. So I could go into this at great, great length, but I would simply say that when you consider it as a purely intellectual problem, it puts a burden of proof on the atheist's shoulders that is really mm. unsustainable. So then how, how would you shift over then to that emotional side okay. of this question? So having said that this isn't really an intellectual problem, I'd say, does Christianity have anything to say about the emotional problem of evil? And I'd say, yes, it does, because it tells us that God is not a cool and distant creator, aloof from the world that he has made. Rather, he is a God who enters into human history in the person of Jesus of Nazareth. And what does he do? He suffers. He bears incomprehensible suffering, Mm -hmm. even though he was totally innocent, to bring us to a knowledge of himself. And so the problem of evil, really, at the end of the day, 
uh, is a problem of our evil, filled with sin, morally guilty before God. The question is not how God can justify himself to us. The question is how can we be justified before him? And there, I think, the cross of Christ yeah. provides the answer. And in the cross, we see the amazing extent of God's love that to redeem us and bring us into fellowship with himself, he would bear incomprehensible suffering for us. And why? Because he loves us so much. How can we reject him mm. who was willing to give up everything for us? Mm. That's good. What would be uh, one or two Christian apologetic arguments that we should never use? Talking to Christians, do not say this. Do not make this argument. It's not good. It's not helpful. It's not accurate. But what might fall into that category? Well, one would be that atheists and agnostics cannot live happily and decent lives. Mm. Um, I think sometimes we wouldn't maybe say that, but I think sometimes we do think that. We think they can't really be happy. They can't really have that fulfilling of a life because we just know they're not supposed to be able to have that as, as yeah. non-Christians. And I, I think that's a big mistake because mm. those of us who've been raised in non-Christian homes uh, have known people who live happy and decent and good lives, even though they may not be believers. So that's a claim that we shouldn't make. Mm. It's a confusion. The claim we should make is that if God does not exist, then life is ultimately meaningless, valueless, and purposeless. That's true, but that isn't to say that just because a person doesn't believe in God that he doesn't experience meaning, value, and purpose. Mm -hmm. There's uh, just no life. intellectual grounds for them to truly have that. Is it, was that how you would, what you would say? What I would say is that what's necessary for meaning, value, and purpose is not the belief in God. It's God. Mm, God is necessary if life is yeah. to have meaning, value, and purpose. And he exists but whether, they, subjective whether they believe it or not. Yeah. 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 Any other really terrible Christian arguments that you would warn us against? Well, I would be cautious about arguments from contemporary miracles, which I think are often ill-evidenced and poorly founded. Mm. I don't think that's probably a really good apologetic either. Peter Williams is one of the world's foremost experts on the Greek New Testament. In this next clip, he addresses the age-old claim that the Bible contains hundreds of contradictions and inaccuracies. Along the way, he engages with the idea that the biblical writers had an unscientific view of the world and that they borrowed from pagan mythology when writing the Bible. Take a listen. Doesn't the Bible contain hundreds of internal contradictions? That's a really interesting uh, question. So, I mean, I actually get a long chapter in my book, Can We Trust the Gospels, on what I think are deliberate contradictions in John's Gospel. And I think Jesus himself taught with contradictions. So, good teachers can use contradiction to convey information, to get you to think more deeply. Now, I'd want to say, I think Scripture is written so that if you seek God, you will find him. And if you don't seek, you will stumble. Mm. That means that there are bits in it which are very clear to understand, and there are bits in that which are more tricky. Sometimes when people say there are contradictions, what they're saying is something like, the same word is used in two different ways. Well, that's just normal. If you don't mm. want to have dictionaries which are too big and you want to make language learning impossible, then you use words in more than one way other things you can have going on in the bible is there can be changes of deal now i could paraphrase the words old testament and new testament to be old deal and new deal as in there are different arrangements that god has for different times mm. and so people can call that a contradiction because the fact that the arrangement has changed once christ arrives to what's before those sorts of things so there are plenty of opportunities for tension and if people want to find fault in the bible they're going to find plenty of reason to do so. But then the flip side is, I think Scripture is written with an amazing unity, amazing harmony across it. And as I've 
researched it more and more, I found more and more coherence and things mm. hold together. The fact is, yes, there are puzzling bits, as there are puzzling bits in an advanced crossword or a really difficult Sudoku, and that's okay. We're dealing with an omniscient God. He knows everything, and he set plenty of challenges there. So I think part of it is just coming to Scripture with the right attitude. Yeah. Have there been situations or contradictions, seeming contradictions, that that puzzled you maybe for a while, but then at some point as you looked more co- closely at them, spent more time studying, you kind of, oh, something opened up and you, you thought, oh, actually, that doesn't really bother me anymore. I, th- I think certainly there have. I think a lot of it is where you realize that you've accepted some assumption about something and that's given you problems later on. So I think that that's what happens. Yeah. All right. The biblical writers had a pre-modern, unscientific view of the world. So how can we trust them to accurately rep- record what actually happened? It's an interesting statement. So I'd, I want to say that they had, when you say unscientific, I'd, I'd maybe choose non-scientific. They weren't thinking in our sort of modern scientific way, but that doesn't mean that they weren't thinking in terms of measuring things and the reality of things. And when you get a description of the temple in first kings and it describes how many cubits this wall is whatever that seems to be it's pretty pre- precise yeah it, it overlaps with the genre that we might have today of architectural plans so it's not that there's a complete discontinuity and i'd want to say you you can you can test the bible at, at, at many points and see its reasonable nature and then i'd also want to say that we need to recognize that cultures can be very scientifically advanced in some ways and pretty immoral i mean the the nazi scientists in the 1930s uh were technically advanced Mm. in many ways and yet very immoral science can't tell you even that science is valuable science can't give you values and so you need values in order to do science that's where actually scripture arguably feeds into the scientific project because it gives you a reason to seek meaning in the universe and to seek to find out mm. things. And a lot of people, a lot of Christians will claim that, yeah, the uh, Christian worldview really gave rise to the scientific yeah, method yeah. And, and science as we know it today. I don't think there's a, there's a lot in that. Mm. All right. Doesn't the Old Testament in particular borrow many of the pagan myths of the ancient Near East, the most famous perhaps being the story of the flood. Yep. And so that would kind of call into question then, that is this authentic uh, scripture from God, revelation from God, or were these these ancient people just kind of borrowing and tweaking what other pagans around them were saying? So what I'd say is when people say X has borrowed Y, they need to demonstrate it. So clearly there are links between Mesopotamian flood stories and the one in the Bible. And one of the clearest parts of that is when it talks about birds being sent out, Mm, uh, both in the Mesopotamian flood story and in the biblical one. But what I'd want to say is when people say uh, the biblical one has borrowed, often what they're doing is they're saying because our physical copy of the Mesopotamian one is older than our physical copy of the biblical one the biblical manuscripts are later therefore one is borrowed from the other but that's confusing the age of the um, medium on which something is transmitted with the age of the wording itself and this can lead you to wrong conclusions so actually there's a guy called Irving Finkel who um, discovered an old Babylonian flood flood tablet and he was absolutely amazed when he was reading this text from 1600 BC or thereabouts when he suddenly saw in that text talk about animals going into the boat two by two and he thought, oh that comes in the bible and suddenly he was prepared to accept that that phrase from the bible was a thousand years earlier than he thought it was hmm. well that's where people get into trouble because they they tend to put artificial maximum ages on the bible stuff they think oh it can't be any older than that well let's face it the copies we have of, of the old testament in hebrew generally are from the year 1000 onwards or you know from the 900s onwards 1000 bc no 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 a- ad ad um now there are some greek copies of things earlier there's dead sea scrolls a bit earlier which have bits of, of genesis but clearly the content comes from a long long time before that 
And I, I think it, it's foolish to try and say to put maximum ages on that. So I think this idea that the Bible, when it parallels stuff from Mesopotamia, has to have borrowed it, I think is, it needs to be questioned. Mm. In our next clip, we're going back to an interview I did with Michael Kruger, professor of New Testament and early Christianity at Reformed Theological Seminary. In this part of our conversation, Mike speaks to evangelicals generally, and parents in particular, about the importance of exposing young people to opposing viewpoints, teaching them how to think critically for themselves about the claims of Christians and non-Christians alike. He highlights the danger of raising kids in a bubble, offering Christians of all ages sound advice for engaging unbelievers with wisdom and love. Um, I know I've heard this story, it almost feels cliched, but the, the story of the, the Christian student who comes into college and eventually loses their faith, often a part of that story is a realization and awakening to the variety of worldviews that are out there. And so I wonder, do you feel like there's a sense in which the evangelical church, whether that's church leaders, even parents, ha- have done a disservice to young people in not perhaps exposing them to the best of the non-Christian intellectual world before they get to a place like college and then all of a sudden uh, find it to be maybe quite compelling. Uh, absolutely, that's the case. Uh, you know, I think you've you've tapped into one of the major challenges that, that Christians have when they show up at the university, which is, uh, I kind of put it this way often when I talk to people, it's like they just find out that they like the non-Christians mm. they meet. I know that's a weird way of saying it, but it's honestly what's happening. They meet non-Christians like, well, I really like this person. They're kind, they're they're funny, they're they're smart, they're thoughtful. They're not a uh, uh, you know, they're not sort of Darth Vader out to, you know, attack every <laughs> believer. They they have good reasons for what they believe. They actually treat other people well. In fact, arguably maybe they even act better than my Christian friends. Now, that that whole dynamic shakes up many many believers. What, what people don't realize, though, is that the reason it shakes up believers is actually they've entered college with a faulty theology uh, that no one's ever corrected. And that faulty theology says that everybody who's an unbeliever is as bad as they can be, or everybody who's an unbeliever is a jerk, or everybody who's an unbeliever is an idiot, or everybody who's an unbeliever is this or that. And the Bible never teaches those things. In fact, on the contrary, the Bible talks about what's called common grace, which is even non-Christians can be highly intelligent, successful, smart, uh, and even thoughtful, kind people. Uh, because God restrains in them what would otherwise be the case uh, in, in terms of their sin. And that, that is something that Christians have always believed theologically, but it's never taught to young people. Hmm. So they go in and they say, well, wait a second, none of that's true. But of course, the thing they thought should be true never should have been true in the first place. Right. And so what you realize is there's a price for, for, for bad theology, and there's a real bad price for it sometimes. Now, how can that be fixed? Well, sometimes it can be fixed just by teaching people about common grace. But like you said, it can also be fixed by exposing students when they're younger to the bigger world that's around them. Now, there's lots of ways to do that. Of course, we won't necessarily probe into all those in this call, but I think as long as that's on the radar of of parents, I think they need to think about ways to get that done. Yeah, I I would imagine, you know, someone listening right now, a parent listening, a high school parent might be feeling like, you know, that sounds good in theory, but that sounds a little bit scary, though. I, I feel like I'm exposing my kid to something that may actually be harmful, might lead them astray. So just speak to that general concern that parents might have on that front. Yeah, see, this is the tightrope balance. On one level, I know parents are very concerned to prevent their kids from being exposed to non-Christian thought. Uh, they don't want them to you know, read the books, watch the movies, even have the friends that might influence them. And there's a, there's a right and proper place to think through those things and how to balance those things. And we're not going to just throw our kids to the wolves, so to speak, when they're so immature they can't handle it. But any good parent, though, over time, slowly recognizes what their kid can understand and can handle and slowly begins to expose them to it so they can understand why it is the way it is. And so I think that's what they have to think about with non-Christians. And, and one simple way of, of doing that is, is for parents to ask themselves, how do they speak about non-Christians to their kids when they speak about them? Mm-hmm. Do they speak about them in a way that seems you know, inherently derogatory and dismissive and that they're, they're kind of all morons and you know, only, only we are the really intelligent and smart ones who figured this all out. If you have a tone in your family like that, wow, you're setting your kids up for a real rude awakening. Mm-hmm. You know, a place to go in that regard is 1 Corinthians 1, where Paul tells the Corinthians that, yeah, the, the gospel is offensive to the world out there. They're, they're always going to stumble over it. But don't think that, don't think you're Christians because you're smarter. Uh, 
Paul goes out of his way in 1 Corinthians to say, no, you guys were not the sharpest knives in the drawer. Don't get me wrong. You're Christians because of God's grace. And so what you realize is that we need to be, we need to be reminded that, that Christians aren't Christians because we're, we're, sharp, we're sharper and smarter. We're Christians because of God's grace. And there's actually many non-Christians that are a lot smarter than us. And being a Christian or not being a Christian has nothing to do with how smart you are. Mm. Well, and that kind of ties into this general topic of humility uh, and, and how do we uh, balance a robust sense of humility with a confidence in what we believe. And I think, um, you know, speaking about college in particular, I, I think one of the, the often touted benefits of college, one of the joys and exciting things about those undergraduate years is that it is a time of exploring and learning and expanding your world a little bit. Uh, so what does it look like for a college student, a young person going into college, to approach it with a level of openness to learning new things, to, to seeing new things, and yet also not to abandon at the same time the kind of core tenets of their worldview? Yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a, a really important thing for people to think through. Um, and you use the term humility there. And I think that's the right term, but the term has to be carefully defined. One of the mistakes that's made is that people, when they think they want to be humble, they actually don't use the biblical definition of humility. They use instead the world's definition of humility. And that's going to get you off the, the, the right tracks from the get-go. The world's definition of humility is basically equating humility with uncertainty. So from the world's perspective, to be humble is to be uncertain. Mm. Uh, to be humble is to say, I don't know. To, 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 to be humble is to say, well, you know, who can know such things? That's the world's definition of humility. Now, of course... That, that's not what Christians believe, and that's not what the Bible says humility is. Christians can be 100% humble and 100% certain of what they believe. And the reason you can is because you believe it based on the fact that God has revealed it in his word, not because you're so smart or you're so great. So you can be really humble and yet still certain about the core truths of the Christian faith. So that's that's the first thing I would say. Second thing, though, is that even if we're, we're certain about the core truths of the Christian faith, there's still a lot of room for humility about how much we still don't know not only about Christianity, but about the world. And so, you know, one, one way that Christians can, can sort of grow and learn and expose themselves to new exciting things in college is to recognize, wow, I'm 18, I'm 19, I haven't seen very much, I don't know very much. Even if I'm certain that Jesus is Lord, there's a lot I don't know about what that means. There's a lot I don't know about how to process that and about what the Bible says. And there's a lot I don't know about the world around me. And I just need to take a big, deep breath, admit I don't know, be humble about it and dive in. Now, when you dive in, you're not just turning your brain off as if you're not still thinking Christianly. Of course, you're still thinking Christianly because the, the Bible is going to guide you in that. But there is a sense of just admitting you don't know what you think you do. And, and this, of course, is the humor of youth, right? I always joke <laughs> with my seminary students. I'm like, you actually are going to know the most the first year you're in seminary. That's what I tell them. And what I mean by that is, of course, they're going to learn a ton of things, but they think they know the most already. And it's only when you'll learn a lot, you realize how much you don't know. And so there's this weird paradox. The more you know, the more you know you don't know, and the more humble that makes you. And that's an that's a advice I would give to college students, too. In our final clip for today, Neil Shenvey shares a fascinating apologetic argument rooted in the study of mathematics. He explains how math, which is itself rooted in the underlying order and structure of the universe, testifies to the existence of a creator God. I then asked Neil to share the best argument against the existence of God that he's ever encountered and how he'd respond to it today. I thought Neil's comments were really insightful and are a great way to close today's episode. It's very interesting, this argument from mathematics, that somehow math itself testifies to the truth of God's existence. Unpack that for us. Sure, we live in a, in a universe with a deeply mathematical structure. Talk to any physicist or even chemist, biologist, will recognize that in math is the language of God. It's really the, the, the way we understand and we, we can perceive that there is objectively a rational mathematical order to the universe. And you can see this in uh, a lot of the early founders of modern physics, like Albert Einstein, uh, Eugene Wigner. They recognized that there was this deep underlying mathematical structure, and they looked for it. They expected to see that the equations governing physics were not just real, but beautiful. That was it's part of the now, it's not the only test for, for a theory's truth, but generally speaking, as a scientist, we look for beauty in the equations that govern the universe. But I ask the question in my book, why is that the case? I mean, I read a lot of, um, I, I read science fiction books, and one of my favorite authors is Brandon Sanderson, who's actually a Mormon, 
But in his books, he often he loves delving into alternative realities where there's an alternative to laws of nature. They follow mm -hmm. certain rules. And he builds entire worlds and realities around these rules of basically magic, what looks like magic to us, but it, it follows rules. But even he has that understanding that yeah, the universe ought to be beautiful and have reasons behind it. But if you think about it, that doesn't really, why? I mean, contrast Brandon Sanderson's novels where there's this, there's this deep backstory and these deep underlying rules, even to his magic. Contrast that with something like C.S. Lewis's Chronicles of Narnia. Now, I love those books. I think they're great. But there's just no rhyme or reason. They're just random things yeah. happen. They can't explain. The magic just happens. Or Harry Potter, too. You read Harry Potter sometimes, you're like, this is just a plot device. <laughs> yeah, no... she, she made it up to fit what she wanted to happen. Exactly. Next. So, but here's the question. Why do we live in a universe that has this deep underlying rationality and mathematical structure and not in a universe that looks like it was created by J.K. Rowling? To fit to fill hmm. some plot device, or you know that just things just happen unaccountably. There's an explanation for them. Why? And I so and then and then second of all, that's number one. We live in this universe with a deep underlying mathematical structure. But but more than that, we can uniquely perceive that as human beings. I mean, other animals, like we're an animal, we're a rational animal. But other animals don't understand. They can't see the structure that's there. They might learn things in some sense. You know, birds can be taught to like tie knots and in twigs and, and build nests and things, but they don't understand quantum mechanics. They don't understand uh, uh, genetics. They don't. So how come human beings uniquely can perceive that underlying structure? So we have two, these two mathematical, these two phenomenon. And again, Eugene Wigner actually wrote a paper on that subject saying those are miracles. Makes no sense. And I'm not even sure if he was a theist or not. I don't know, but he recognized it's extremely odd that we live in a mathematical universe and that too we can perceive that fact unlike all these other intelligent animals. So I'm arguing, well, that doesn't make sense if you're an atheist. Why would there be this structure and why would we be able to perceive it uniquely? But as a Christian, I can say, ah, it's because God himself is, the, is, the, is a mind who created the universe and he made us in his image to be able to uniquely perceive his handiwork in a way that other animals could not. So it means to be in the, in the image of God. I wonder if you could uh, maybe put on your uh, your atheist hat and uh, give us what would be the best argument against belief in God that you've encountered, and then how would you, putting your apologetics hat back on, your Christian hat back on, how would you then respond to that? I think the the best argument against Christianity, ironically, see, people often will conflate the two. They'll argue against Christianity and think they're arguing against God. And they, they, obviously, if for the Christian God is true, we want to put people to Christianity. That's fair. But they'll often say things like, well, uh, how can you, can you believe that God exists, say, if the, the universe is older than 6,000 years? I'm saying, well, okay, you can ask that question, but what you're really asking is, how do you know the Bible's inerrant? How do you know the Bible is uh, have errors in it? I can answer that question. I'm an inerrantist, but don't confuse these objections about, say, the Bible with objections about God existing or even about Christianity, um, because I think, again, I am an inerrantist. I think it's an important doctrine. And yet don't confuse believing the Bible is inerrant with, say, being a Christian or believing in Jesus. They, you know, mm -hmm. Even the Chicago Statement on Inerrancy said, no, there are Christians who are not inerrantists. Um, and so I, I just want to distinguish between those two objections. So the best argument against God's existence, though, uh, and I would think is the problem of hit, divine hiddenness. This issue of, well, if God really does love us and God is a good God, then why doesn't he reveal himself? And the problem of evil, I think, is also a big one. But I think actually, for reasons I go into in the book, it's, it's less, um, I think, troubling, not troubling, but it's less problematic than the problem of why does God hide himself? Mm. And But again, this is where I think good theology can help us explain these questions, answer these questions. What I would say is that uh, that question assumes that if we had more evidence, our problems would be solved. But the Bible says, no, your problem is not that you lack evidence. Your problem is you hate God. Your problem is that you are in, at enmity with God. You wish he didn't exist. And therefore, all the evidence in the world can't remove that hatred. No, in other words, if I, uh, just, if I say, well, I don't believe in Lord Voldemort, right? The villain from Harry Potter. I don't believe in him. Uh, give me more evidence. If someone gave me evidence that Voldemort existed, I would say, great, but now I loathe this Voldemort who exists. I thought he was just a fictional character. Now I realize, oh, he's real. Oh, I loathe him even more. So 
in the same way, if our fundamental problem is that we do not like the fact there's a God, we want to be our own gods, then hiddenness is not a big problem because it just says, look, God has not given you all the evidence he could. He'd give you more evidence that wouldn't solve your problem. So why, why blame God for not giving you things you don't need? What you really need is a change of heart. Now then you ask, well, why can't God change my heart? Ah, and that's why I, that's where I transition to the gospel. God has given a way for your heart to be changed, but it's not through the Kalam cosmological argument. It's not through reasoning and uh, about these abstract ideas. It's through the cross. God has made a way for us to have our hearts changed, and it's through embracing what Jesus has done for us on the cross. So again, that's a good. It's a great transition in my book from from saying, "Look, these intellectual problems that we've been wrestling with for." for you know 150 pages they're ultimately solved not primarily in a better argument but in the gospel and that's what's going to ultimately convince you that christianity is not just true but worth embracing thanks so much for joining us on this journey through the archives of the crossway podcast if you want to hear more of any of the interviews featured today we've linked to all of them in the show notes below For more audio content like this, subscribe to the Crossway Podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or your favorite podcast player. If you enjoyed this episode, consider sharing it with a friend and leaving us a review. Crossway is a not-for-profit Christian ministry that exists solely for the purpose of proclaiming the truth of God's Word through publishing gospel-centered content. Visit us today at crossway.org.